Welcome into Pirates Weekly. I'm Oliver Nisi, co-host alongside Leverett Ball. This week's guest is J.J. Raderick. J.J. Raderick is the Pirates color commentator for the season. He's also been the color commentator in 2018 and 2019. J.J., you're joining us from Colorado, uh, where you reside in the offseason. Uh, you know, we're in the month of March, J.J. Ha- has this winter been a lot of snow in Colorado like it has uh, around here in Mass? No, I think we actually sent you all of the snow. Uh, we, we've had a very mild winter, but the running joke in Colorado is if you don't like the weather, just wait five minutes and it could change. So it was beautiful today. It was 60 degrees. Tomorrow it could be a completely different story. It's pretty similar yeah, out, out no in New question. England with uh, the New England weather. You know, one day it could be freezing, you know, it could be black ice or, you know, the wind chill is, you know, 30 miles an hour. And then and the next day, like you said, um, could be 50, 50, 60 degrees. Uh, JJ, as I mentioned, you're the color commentator of the Mass Pirates. And, uh, you know, I want to get this interview off by starting uh, talking about the Pirates and some of your memories back in your first season with the Pirates in 2018. Uh, the Pirates uh, were a brand new team at the time. And uh, you were in the broadcast booth with not only the voice of the Massachusetts Pirates, Mick Monihoff, uh, also John Meter Perel. He was part of the broadcast team uh, back in 2018. So uh, what were some of your fun memories in that first season? Uh, I'd say, you know, even going back before the first season, how it all started, where I met the owner, Jawadi Team, uh, he and I actually met over in China when we were both playing the inaugural season of the Chinese Arena Football League uh, back in 2016. And uh, I remember he told me, he said, I'm going to try and bring an arena team uh, to Massachusetts. There's a great market. There's no one there. And so we're going to try and do that. So uh, he said, would you want to be involved or help out? And I didn't really know what capacity he was thinking. And then he got everything going and he called me and he said, I'd like to uh, like to bring you in as a a broadcaster. And uh, we always kind of joke. You always say, well, okay, at least I know that my playing days are done. They've asked me to uh, trade in the helmet for the suit and tie. And so I'll go up to the booth, but uh, I, I was really looking forward to it. And um, so I, I really remember there was a lot of good times that first year, I, I think probably my, you know, there was a walk-off touchdown that was pretty exciting. And, and um, I remember that, but I think probably if you had to say fondest memories would be that first game um, being in a three-man booth with John Meter Perel and Mick Moninghoff. Now Mick and I, had worked together uh, a long time before, both when I was playing and also in a, in a broadcasting capacity at some point, always loved working with them, always respected him uh, for his professionalism and, you know, the questions he asked as a player. And, um, you know, you, you always know that he's got to ask some things, but he always did it in a very tactful way. So always loved working with Mick. Then I got to know John and John and I uh, really got along well loved working with him. So to put those three together uh, was really exciting. And, you know, just being there that first game and seeing not only the fans, but a lot of the players, some of the first year players there took me back to when I first started and arena football, indoor football gave me so many opportunities and did so much for me. I I can't even begin to count um, the, the doors that it opened. So to help in some way, whatever it is, uh, so that other guys get to pursue and have doors open for them um, and maybe impart some knowledge to some folks watching the game that maybe don't know as much about it uh, is really a great opportunity. So I was very fortunate, very thankful that Jawad and the rest of the Massachusetts Pirates uh, said, hey, even though you're in Denver, we'd like to bring you out here to try and launch this thing and, and move this thing in the right direction. Yeah, you mentioned also that both you and Jawad played in China. Another uh, quarterback, both of you were quarterbacks, but another quarterback playing in China at the time is the Pirates' current starting quarterback, Sean Brackett. Now, my first question in the interview is going to be an uncomfortable one. Of the three of you, you, Jawad, and Sean, who was the best quarterback when you were all active players? Well, Everett, it's it's really not a difficult question because I guess we just have to go to some numbers, you know. It's, you know that that would be unfair. Uh, longevity should not constitute as just making you better. Um, you know, it was a short stint in China, um, so and that was a whole different deal over there. Uh, I, I will say, you know, Jawad, I thought I, I did not know him before, and I thought he 
uh, played really well, well over there. Now, Sean and I were actually in Las Vegas together in 2015. And so I've kind of watched the maturation process of Sean and then he becomes the MVP in 2018 and, and deservingly so. Um, so I thought that was a really savvy move on Jawad's part, uh, getting Sean. He, you know, he's a guy from their Columbia University from up in that region. Um, but I could see the physical tools uh, that Sean had uh, pretty early on, even in Las Vegas. And um, I knew he was going to develop if he stuck with it, develop into a, a prolific quarterback. And he certainly is. And he's a, always going to be at the upper echelon and, and really on in all the leagues that he plays in. And uh, unfortunately, I, I saw a lot of good things from Jawad, but his sample size was small. So uh, I don't know what the league rules are, but uh, I certainly don't want anything bad to happen. But maybe if Sean says, you know, I'm a little tired this week, I'd like to just rest the arm and Jawad could go in there. I think you'd see the same production. But for me, I think my days are probably as, uh, as we're staring down the big 40, I think my days might be a little bit behind me. So who knows in the past to answer your question, Leverett, but uh, currently uh, those guys hate to admit it. They might have a leg up on me at this point. But if I remember correctly, Sean was your, your backup in Las Vegas um, earlier on in his career before his MVP days. Um, were you somewhat of a mentor to him kind of teaching him the way as a quarterback? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And that was, as I was getting into, you know, the, the later stages of my career, you're talking about 10, 11 years and, it's like anything. You kind of realize that um, you want to make it better than when you were there or leave something behind. And so the best way to do that is to mentor uh, a quarterback like that. And when you have a, a fresh face rookie, it doesn't matter if it's the NFL or the AFL or the CFL, whatever it is, if you have an opportunity to mentor them and give back and they're willing to, uh, to learn and to listen and to take in the knowledge that you have from all of your past failures and successes, it makes it that much easier. So uh, I did, I, I kind of, you, you want to, you don't want to overcoach them or you don't want to tell them anything they don't, but you just want to say, this is a different game. There's a lot of different things. Let me tell you some of the things that I did that I wish I could go back because you can go back. You're already at that point for me, not make those mistakes and then move on. And, and Sean, uh, really took to that. And even Jawad in China, uh, I mean, he was one of the first guys to come up and ask me a lot of different questions about footwork and reads and what I was seeing and what I had seen over the years. So uh, I, I was really fortunate to have the opportunity to kind of um, go through that with both uh, Jawad and Sean. So JJ, I mean, you, yourself, you've played for a lot of different teams in your career. You played in different leagues, including the Arena Football League the AF2, uh, you know, the IFL for a brief moment. Um, you know, Sean, he's entering a new league this year in the IFL. So, you know, how do you think he's going to fare in a different league? Uh, you know, because you've, you know, you have some experience moving from league to league. Yeah. Um, knowing Sean and knowing his preparation, I know he'll, he'll be ready. Um, and, and so he's got a full, off season now and, and obviously given the situation he's got a little bit longer to prepare uh, and I know he's been working on the different rules of this league compared to what he's used to uh, so I know he'll be prepared and um, I you know for instance you did mention it was a brief stint for myself in the IFL and it does have rules there's a two men in motion instead of just the one guy in high motion um, and also uh you know, they had rules at the time where there wasn't necessarily a tight end where there is and what I was used to. So quick little story. The first game I got there, I only had limited practice. I went through the playbook. I knew just enough, just in case it was a game that fortunately we were winning and in control of. So they said, Hey, we're going to let you go in and finish this thing out. So I went in, we, we called a, a play action boot. Uh, and I was just really supposed to uh, to fake it and then run around the end. And if it was, wasn't there, get what you can or slide, get down and whatever. Well, what I'm used to a tight end was the backside guard essentially uh, as the down lineman. And I, as I came out of my play action fake, I looked, he was basically staring at me because he had taken his, the defensive lineman down in a turn and was facing me. 
So I thought he was eligible and I, in my head, I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to be really smart here. I'm just going to flip the ball to him. He's going to turn around and score. They're going to be like, wow, this guy's really heady. He's got this down already. Turns out he's ineligible. So I threw the ball at him and it was, you know, like a game of hot potato when he jumped out of there, like this thing was on fire. And, you know, I thought, well, geez, I thought you'd want a touchdown too. The big guys always like scoring. And I go, and I turned to the coach and he said, there's no eligible tight end here. And I thought, I didn't do enough studying of this right away. It was because I was thrown in, you know, two days in. I, I thought I knew all the rules, but there was some little nuances. Sean will not run into that. And I know Jawad as an owner will have him prepared for that. But um, there are there are things that jump up at you and you have to be prepared for. But I know that those guys are going to have their ducks in a row to speak and uh, hopefully won't have the gaff that I had uh, in the middle of a game. That sounds like what would happen if Oliver or I, you know, or I had to be an emergency <laughs> quarterback this season. So, you know, that's that's why we're on the media team now. You know, we threw a lot of passes to ineligible receivers back in our playing days. So Yeah, but if we all have our part and that's what makes that's what steers the ship and keeps it going down, yep. uh, keeps it powering through the water, so to speak there. Yeah, we've had that conversation a lot uh in this off season, especially on Pirates Weekly with some players making jokes that you know, maybe Leverett or I might have to come in for the scout quarterback. But, you know, after learning about some of your career and Jawad's there and, you know, you can always throw Arthur the Pirate in there. You never know. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hey, if you get the opportunity, it's a once in a lifetime. It may just not be really that that shining moment, but it's always memorable, at least. As much as we joke about emergency quarterbacks, though, we saw that in the NFL because of the pandemic when the Broncos – all of their quarterbacks, you you know, weren't wearing their masks in that meeting and they're ineligible. The Broncos appealed to the league to see if their offensive coordinator could start a quarterback. The league wouldn't let them. So they let that practice squad wide receiver, Kendall Hilton, uh, Hinton, play play quarterback in a game. So, I mean, as much as we joke about that, that did that did happen in 2020. Yeah. So, yeah. No, it's it, we've we if we've learned nothing from 2020, it's that or excuse me, if we learn anything, it's that anything literally can happen. Did you ever think you'd see an NFL game where someone starting at quarterback had um, never taken an NFL or hadn't taken an, a snap at that position since sometime in college? Yeah. yeah, sometime in college or pre, you know, maybe at high school. I think he'd taken some, but I mean, anything is possible. And I actually have a friend who coaches for the Broncos. And when I read that on the, on the ticker, on the TV, I, I, you know, called him and I said, is this true? And I have to tell you guys, there was a little part of me that now, maybe bigger part than I'm willing to admit that wanted to say, if you need someone, I would do, I won't know anything from Adam. This is like Saturday night. You know, what are they going to be able to teach me? How much of the playbook am I going to be able to, uh, to comprehend, but I, I just remember thinking, you know, maybe there was a glimmer there for a minute. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it never leaves you once you've done it. And in fact, I remember in 2018, when you talk about injuries, um, uh, when Sean Brackett missed the, uh, the playoff game, the first round playoff game, um, you know, I talked to Jawad, he said, maybe we fly out here instead of, um, putting you up in the booth, would you want to put a helmet back on? And, uh, you know, at the time, uh, it just, it didn't make sense. And if I remember correctly, it was Darren Thomas, uh, who played quarterback yeah. that game, um, and, and played really well. And, and Jawad said, you know, but just in case Darren got hurt, would you want to do it? And we ultimately kind of talked about it and decided that that wasn't going to be necessary. Um, but yeah, it's you literally, and, and as a, a, an athlete, you never can let it go. People always say I hung up the cleats or I hung it up. You didn't. It's you may have hung it up, but it's still accessible and you can take it off the rack anytime you want. No question. Well, you mentioned also, you know, you thought about hitting up the Broncos. You know, when you were playing um, in your indoor professional career, did you work out with any NFL teams or reach out to any of them? Or is that something you're interested in doing? Um, you know, I, I, I certainly was. Um, my At the end of my college career, I worked out for the Seahawks, Broncos and the Colts. Um, and it was actually uh, the scout for the Broncos who um, kind of was real transparent. He said, you're kind of a bubble guy, not necessarily 
going to draft, you know, draftable on our board. Um, but what we, you know, he said, I don't know what your thoughts are about the CFL or the arena leagues. Cause he had a friend and the arena leagues. And at the time I said, no, I, I'm good. I've, I've had a nice career uh, here and I'm good. And then I went into the quote unquote real world or the working world. And I just realized that I wasn't done. And I thought, you know what, let me see if I can get back into it. And I had this opportunity uh, for arena football mm-hmm. uh, ended up being AF2 as Oliver mentioned earlier. And I told myself I'd give it, you know, a few years and it started off not very, it started off extremely rocky at the beginning. And I wasn't really sure. Uh, but then once I figured out the game a little bit more and kind of caught my stride, then um, I realized over the years, yes, I would love to an opportunity back at the NFL or really one at the NFL um, it, more so than just a workout. But uh, mm. I kind of got to the point where I said, you know, I am waking up every day. I'm going to play football. It's not financially as lucrative as you, as a lot of people see in the NFL, and it may not be what you thought, but it still was, was my profession. And I absolutely tried to enjoy every single second of it. Um, would I have loved that opportunity? Absolutely. But do I lose sleep over that? No, I was unbelievably happy with everything that the Arena League offered me and, uh, and continues to offer to me. Talking with J.J. Raderick, the color commentator for the Massachusetts Pirates, Oliver Nisi and Leverett Ball, Team Insiders. Uh, J.J., you know, we a lot about your former career as a quarterback, and I just want to let Pirates Nation know uh, how good you were once you hit your stride. Uh, like you were saying, you know, you said you got off to a little bit of a rocky start as a pro, but uh, in 2012, you played for the Iowa Barnstormers, who the Pirates are actually going to play this season, uh, but this is when the Barnstormers were in the AFL uh, you threw for 93 touchdown passes that year, and you broke a franchise record set by the Barnstormers by Hall of Famer Kurt Warner. And I'm sure a lot of Pirates fans and football fans everywhere know or have heard of the name Kurt Warner, especially in this neck of the woods because we beat him, uh, the Patriots beat him in the 2001 Super Bowl. So have you met Kurt before, or what's it feel like to break an NFL Hall of Fame uh, quarterback's record? Yeah, well, certainly Kurt and I had uh, – we took different forks in the road <laughs> after the arena league. Uh, I, I actually, th- there's a lot of, um, if a player ever tells you, you know, I'm that individuals, things don't matter. I- I'll tell you they're lying because there is a lot of time where you're lifting by yourself. You're watching film by yourself. So to celebrate some of those successes or some of those records. Now, obviously I had an unbelievable supporting cast uh, that year. I had, uh, some of the best wide receivers in the league. I, I would have put them up against any of the receiving cores in the league. Uh, the offensive line was young, but by the time they found their stride, um, you know, we won some games that people didn't think we would. We had a really talented team that kind of caught on a little late that made a little push a little late to get into the playoffs. But that year was really special for me. Um, and so circling back to personal um, records like that do mean something. They always do, but they mean even more when your name is mentioned in the same sentence as Kurt Warner, not necessarily because of what he did after he left the arena leagues, but because of who he is and how he represents himself. I mean, he was, could you find really a classier human being walking the earth? If you, if anyone's watched his story or anyone's watched an interview with him or anything. So to have an opportunity to record from a a former NFL MVP and Super Bowl MVP was phenomenal, but to be at Kurt Warner because of who he is and to be mentioned in the same sentence made it even that much more special. And uh, I, I did get to meet Kurt. Not then. I met him a couple years before uh, when I was in Chicago. We were playing in Arizona, and he came to the game because he was he was living there at the time, and, uh, uh, and he still might. I'm not even sure, but. Um, I remember going over to him and just introducing myself and I just thanked him. And it was, I said, thank you. And, you know, it wasn't for coming to the, it was for everything he did for every guy that played on that 50 yard field was he gave it a lot of credibility. 
Um, people who maybe thought it was a joke said, well, this guy came out of there and he had fared pretty well for him, but also how he carried himself and who he is and how he represents us uh, as, as athletes, as football players, as arena players. Uh, so that was extra special uh, to be in there. And um, yeah, it's, it, and it's kind of fun. I now coach at a college here. And uh, when the head coach introduced me, uh, to the players. He said, JJ played in the arena leagues. And some of the guys said, okay, I've seen those games before. I know what they are. And they said, and he broke Kurt Warner's record. Then that kind of earned some <laughs> more credibility. So it, it certainly helped out, but yeah, something that I'll, I'll definitely be very, very proud of, uh, as a personal level and thankful that I played with that great team that allowed us to, to achieve that. Well, and I guess IFL, um, employees just blow NFL hall of fame quarterbacks, out of the water, there's actually another IFL employee, Chris Redman, who um, yeah. was drafted before Tom Brady. So, you know, he was drafted before Brady. You broke Kurt Warner's record. Um, you know, I guess, who knows? I mean, the IFL, I guess that's that's all the IFL does is just, you know, break Hall of Fame players' records and yeah, it, get drafted before them. Yeah, they need to quit going to these – they need to go to these IFL games first, these NFL scouts do. And, and, and we joke about that, and it's a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but it's it really is true. I I would tell people, and, and I would tell anyone who has not been to an arena or an indoor game before, there is an unbelievable amount of talent playing on those fields, and they should not discount those guys. A lot of those guys just didn't get an opportunity, didn't get a look, maybe went to a smaller school something happened where they just didn't get it. And I, I'm telling you, I've played with guys that have played in the NFL. I played with guys that certainly should have been there or should have gotten back in there, whatever the case may be. But the level of football and the talent, if you have never been to a game and you come to one, you will not be disappointed. You, you will not only are you closer to the action, it's a lot of fun. You will not be disappointed in what you see out there as far as the product. You're right. And, you know, in other sports, they have an affiliated minor league system. Actually, Oliver and I kind of talked with Jawad about this a little bit. You know, in, in Major League Baseball, for example, the, the various minor league baseball teams, you know, have that affiliation with the big clubs. So, you know, while you're playing on those teams, you're technically, you know, a, a prospect of an MLB team. But, you know, with football, there's no affiliation between, you know, the NFL and then the IFL or CFL teams. But that's the next level of play you know, below the NFL. Um, and I think because there isn't the official connection the way there is in other sports, kind of like you said, some people underestimate it. And you hear, like when I've told people, you know, I work with the Pirates, they have all these misconceptions. They ask, you know, do the players actually get get paid? You know, were they like, you know, stuff like that? You know, or did they all play at Division three colleges? People don't understand, you know, a lot of these guys, you know, they played at some of the best college programs in the country. There are guys, a lot of guys who have been in NFL training camps and even guys who are on 53 man rosters. Um, and then of course, you know, the pirates a little while back had Dexter McCluster is actually an NFL pro bowler. Yeah. So um, yeah, I mean, there is definitely more talent at this level than people outside the league might realize. Oh, I, I could not agree uh, anymore. Um, and it's, uh, it's exciting to see when, when people actually recognize that and all those same questions, uh, people over the years, do you get paid? Uh, what, did you play in high school? Is it tackle? Do you wear helmets? And, uh, you know, you kind of had to joke and say, yeah, no, we got, we have lights and coaches and actual football pants and shoulder pads and the whole deal, you know, and you try it, you try and understand that, uh, they just haven't been introduced to it before, but yeah, we all fielded those questions over the years and, and it is a little tough, but you, you learn to accept that you learn to understand it. But what you try and do is get those folks that have show a little bit of an interest and say, well, if you're a sports fan, might I suggest coming to a game here. Once you do, I always tell people you were hooked. Like once you <laughs> went, you say, well, this is, I could go to a movie where I can probably guess the ending there. I gotta be quiet. You know, it's, if you're going to go somewhere, it's unscripted for two and a half hours. The kids won't have any more fun. I can't imagine. Um, you will be entertained. The players love it. It's interactive. Uh, it really is a, a, a fun twist, so to speak, on football and, and on professional football. And that's the thing is you do have to remind people 
uh, people would say, you know, did you ever, I, I like the question when people say, did you ever want to go pro? And early in your career, you tried not to be too crass with it, but you'd say, well, what do you do for a living? And they'd say, well, I'm this, that, or the other. I'm a teacher, I'm an accountant, or whatever that might be. And you'd say, well, did you want to go pro in that? Because if you get paid for that, that's your profession. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, albeit we don't get paid a ton, you know, that's early on, that's kind of the answer that you're thinking in your head, but certainly you don't say that. Really what you do is you try and introduce those people and say, this is, uh, I understand that what you don't understand, but give me an opportunity, come see a game. And a lot of those people would come to a game and they'd be at every single one thereafter. Uh, JJ, uh, so you're talking about, when you're talking about Kurt Warner, how, you know, you, you didn't appreciate him so much for, you know, how great of a football player he was. You more appreciated his story. Um, you know, I'm sure, I think, I don't know his whole story off the top of my head. I know it has a big part has to do with his wife and, um, you know, their, their relationship. But uh, one thing that really stood out in my research when I, uh, before this interview was in 2014, you received the arena football leagues, Al Lucas man of the year award, which is the NFL equivalent, NFL equivalent of the Walter Payton man of the year award. So uh, if people aren't familiar with that, it's basically, uh, you know, being a hero, being a superhero uh, off the field, like away from the game in the community. Uh, would you say that that award, uh, receiving that award was your, your, your biggest accomplishment as a, as a player? Uh, you know, you can, you can kind of categorize uh, what is the biggest accomplishment. And I think unfortunately or not unfortunately, but there's just different categories wherever that one fits. It's at the top for sure. Uh, because people recognize who you were, like we talked about with Kurt Warner, what you stood for. And, and you don't set out to try and win that award. What you try and do is you set out to say, like we've talked about, this game has a lot, at the time it was allowing me to stay out of the real world, the real working world. It was allowing me to just keep playing a game as long as I could. So uh, I could just sustain doing that for a long time. Uh, so you said, well, I want to show my appreciation for it. And as time goes on, you say, but now it's leading to this and now it's leading to recognition here. And uh, it leads to a lot of different things. So, um, yes, that that one was, um, you know, for my mom, it was a tearjerker when she when I told her. Uh, and and that was even just seeing her emotion and my dad's emotion when when I won that one was really special. Um because it kind of validates all those years, uh, not only uh, on the field, but off the field, everything that you do. And so it was a great opportunity throughout my time to get involved because in this league or in these leagues, you get involved in the community. You go to schools constantly. You go to hospitals. You go uh, to uh, do read with the kids or go to different events here and there. And, you, and the fans have access to you, which is really cool. And uh, I enjoyed every bit of that. So um, I got to enjoy doing those things. And then to be recognized for it was awfully special. Well, and also, you know, um, you're telling us a little bit about how, you know, you, you coach at the college level in addition to broadcasting and, and live in Colorado in the off season. But obviously it's been a really weird off season with the pandemic and everything that's gone on. And we've talked with a lot of guests about this, about, you know, how they've gotten through these unusual times, but how has your off season been? And, you know, what have you been up to? Uh, it's been the longest off season ever <laughs> right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was actually hired in July. Um, uh, and uh, we quickly soon after uh, it's at the FCS level. And we soon after found out that we weren't going to play in the fall, but they said we're going to play a spring season. Um, some circumstances have come up and we are actually not participating in the FCS spring season right now. Uh, our uh, school and administration and staff have kind of deemed that it's better for us to get prepared, have an actual spring practice schedule uh, like normal, and then get back on schedule next year in mm -hmm. the fall with hopefully, you know, everything is a little bit more normal and stadiums start to fill up. Uh, so it's been an extremely long off season, but, uh, that it's kind of like anything, you know, I made a joke about Kurt and I taking different forks in the road, but when you're faced with these big decisions and adversities, and we all have in the last year, uh, what 
what do you take? What approach do you take? What road do you take? And it's either just sit there and complain about it and mope about it. Or in my particular instance, it was, I'm going to try and make myself the best college coach that I can. Uh, and I've got, I looked at it and said, I've got a lot of time to do so. You know, I need to, I, I've been around the passing game for a long time. Uh, I need to get my doctorate in the run game. So, you know, getting more versed in that and getting more versed, spent time with defensive coaches to understand why they do certain fronts, blitzes, coverages, when they do it. And everyone has different philosophies, but, you know, it was kind of one of those things I thought it, it can be advantageous if you, if you want it to be. And so that's really what we just tried to do. We just said it, we can't control those things, but what we can control is kind of cliche, but how we react to it. So that's kind of the, the route that most of us uh, have taken. And, you know, hopefully a lot of people are, are taking that. And as I joke with uh, my quarterbacks, who I coach, not every day is going to be a spiral, you know, not every throw is going to be one, not every day is going to be one. So uh, that's okay. Um, but we're all dealing with it. Um, we're all going through it together. And, you know, hopefully we're all going to come out when things do return a little bit more to normal, uh, a lot better in our professions or with, you know, our relationships uh, and how that all in our friendships and how that all um, turns out. But uh, hopefully it's, it's sooner rather than later on that. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, kind of focusing on what you can control and, and that's the approach to take, you know, in, you know, this past year in 2020 now into 2021, because a lot of things have been out of our control and just about every prediction I've made uh, for the future since the pandemic started has been wrong. So I'm just rolling with it now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then in that case, give me the Powerball numbers that you would <laughs> use and then I'll okay. figure out the inverse. And, Perfect. Uh, and then exactly. I'll, and by then I'll have a private jet to come out from Denver to Massachusetts. Sounds good. You can maybe give me a little bit of commission on your, on oh, your, yeah, yeah. perfect. Yeah. Leverett, I'll, I'll, I'll have to, it'll be a strong commission for you. Sounds good. <laughs> perfect. JJ Raderink. Sorry. I keep saying it wrong. JJ Raderink, uh, joining us, Leverett Ball and myself on Pirates Weekly. You brought a Powerball. Uh, it, it reminded me for some reason to mention that Pirates Weekly, this episode is sponsored by Bud Light. I'm not sure if you knew that, JJ. So um, please remind Pirates Nation fans, listeners everywhere, drink responsibly. JJ, I want to keep going with this interview, and I want to inch back to the Pirates uh, as we start to wrap up this interview. But before I do that, um, also through my research, uh, you started your pro career with the Spokane Shock in their inaugural season in 2006. Um, I'm not sure how if you were with the team the whole season, but – uh, I bring up the shock because uh, that's the Pirates uh, opening night opponent for this season. Uh, the first game the Pirates fans are going to be able to see in, in person since 2019 is going to be against the shock. So have you looked into that matchup at all? And what do you think about uh, the shock coming to Worcester? Well, uh, I'll tell you this. Uh, when I was there in 2006, it was AF2. That town was just absolutely embraced that team. I was only there, unfortunately, for training camp before I got traded off. I, uh, the head coach said, I think there's a lot of potential uh, here, um, but, um, you know, I just can't start a rookie. I just don't feel comfortable with doing that. But I will tell you this. I went back the next year, my second year, and played there. You, at the time, could not buy a ticket to go watch a Spokane Shock game. It was wow. unbelievable. I played, I played at Texas A&M in college in front of, you know, 80 some thousand people at the time. Now I think it's over a hundred thousand, but I played down there and it was almost every bit as loud as that it, for 10,000 people. It was an unbelievable atmosphere. Um, they've always had a, a success. They've always had a, a better than average or better than quality team um, uh, that they've put out there. And so That'll be a great first test for the Pirates. Um, you know, as it gets closer and training camp winds down, then you can study as far as an analyst, uh, the players, and who's going to be the make of the team, who's got some experience, especially in this game. Uh, so that'll be very interesting. But just know historically what Spokane has, has been, um, not just the support, but what they've been on the field. It'll be a great test for the Pirates. 
and uh, it will be a great game, and I can't wait to be a part of it. Well, you mentioned playing at Texas A&M, and again, going back to what we talked about, about how indoor players are not just guys from Division three schools. I mean, Texas A&M, that's a pretty solid football school. What was your career like? Kind of a two-pronged question. What was your career like at A&M? We've asked you a lot about your pro career. What was it like playing there? And also, how would uh, Johnny Manziel do in the IFL? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I played at there. I, I played at Wyoming, and I played at a Okay. Yeah, but um, – uh, just to tell you, I mean, that experience, uh, was unlike any other. I mean, th- there's a lot of great college, um, uh, game days. I, I think any, anyone agrees Michigan, Ohio state would be a bucket list game. You know, the iron bowl between Alabama and Auburn army Navy. There's so many, um, and so many cool traditions, but the 12th man and the towels down there at a and it's, I could go on forever. They had the night before they call it yell practice. They had 35,000 people show up the night before the game to practice their cheers for the next day. Our, wow. our equipment managers went over there and they said, they get as many people for practice as we do for a game. Uh, you know, that's what our stadium held at Wyoming anyway, but it was, it was an experience like, like none other, um, you know, can't even hear yourself. Think no one else can hear you. Uh, but just unbelievable to answer your question about Johnny Manziel um a lot of talent a ton of talent uh you know I think he might be the definition of the cliche word moxie for a quarterback uh and if he just I, I think one of the big things is if he can really commit himself to what he's doing um and there's going to be distractions. There's going to be some things, but he seems like the type that he's got so much raw athletic talent uh, that if he committed himself to it, really learn the game, he would figure it out. And in the IFL compared to uh, what I was used to, you can run a little bit more, uh, especially a quarterback. It's not, uh, it's not as condensed as far as that goes. So I think he'd actually be pretty effective like a lot of players if they, they put the effort and the time into it that's needed. But when you start with that much athletic ability, you know, you're, you're at a pretty good launch point to have a good career if you'd like to have one. Well, cause he's playing in the fan controlled league now. And he said that, you know, he doesn't want to uh, go back to the NFL ever. He's done with that, but that'd be pretty cool to see him playing in the IFL. Maybe not so fun for the pirates if they had to go up against them, but yeah, I mean, there are a few, you know, ex NFL guys who I'd love to see play in the IFL. Yeah, I, we always joked at quarterback what guys could make the transition from outdoor to indoor um, just because it's such a different game. The throws are different. The timing's different. Uh, but at the end of the day, it still is football. So you've got to uh, you've got to adapt to it no matter what the conditions or what the field is like or, you know, how big it is. Um, but it's we always have that talk, you know, who would have translated the best at each position and uh, that's a debate that you can have over many a nights. Well, and when Tom Brady turns 75 and retires from the NFL, he can also yeah. play in the IFL. So, yeah, he, I, my guess is he won't be done playing. <laughs> I, I don't know what he's going to do. And I know the name right now probably stings a lot of folks up in that area. And I definitely understand, uh, you know, I've, uh, I'm a fan of, of good quarterback play and obviously He's given us a lot of that over the last, you know, 18, 19, 20 years, whatever the career has been, or even before that at Michigan. So um, pretty interesting, uh, pretty unbelievable what he just accomplished and what he just did. And uh, you just sit there and, you know, sometimes you say, I don't know if this guy would make it. or I don't think this guy, if Tom Brady came indoors, I have no doubt based on what I've heard about his work ethic, there would be a very short learning curve and he would be in the MVP discussion right away. But uh, my guess is he's going to go ahead and stay playing on that Sunday leagues in the fall there. (laughs) Fair enough. All right, JJ, thank you so much for coming on Pirates Weekly. Uh, You know, and keep enjoying your off season. Uh, Forgot to mention, but you are the defensive backs coach at Northern uh, University of Northern Colorado. I wanted to throw that tidbit in there so Pirates Nation knew that. Um, You know, enjoy wrapping up spring ball for them. I would love to have you back on the show. And, uh, you know, as the season gets go- uh, is about to begin, training camp, some cuts will be made. I'd love to talk some more Pirates and the personnel with the players. 
with you if you're up for that. I would absolutely love that. And uh, this is a little inside info that maybe the fans are going to get. I actually, even though the website says defensive backs, I've recently just been moved back to uh, quarterback. So now I'm counting. Um, uh, coaching the quarterbacks again. Uh, loved working with the spot. Yeah, it's, it is a little bit more natural there. So the website will be updated, but that gives you a little bit of insight there to what's going on in my professional life. But Oliver Leverett, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to talking to you guys again and um, some pirate football and really looking forward to seeing what this season has in store for them. It's going to yeah. be fun. Absolutely. All right. Well, hey, congrats on that quarterback coach and Pirates Nation, thank you for tuning in to Pirates Weekly this week. We will see you next week.